Um, one of us should make an announcement that um, this is being recorded on Northampton Community Television and that it is uh, Wednesday, May 7th, 8 a.m., a scheduled board meeting, but there's no quorum. So this will not be an official board meeting, uh, but we're going to conduct the business that we came to conduct the uh, discussions that we came to conduct, although there'll be no business conducted today. That sounds safe? Yes. Yeah. Thank Perfect. You. Thank you for making that statement. One of us should say that. I think one of us just did. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, public comment. Uh, on that? <coughs> no public. So the idea here in getting some of these documents in front of the board was to to get you sort of slowly immersed in the comprehensive wastewater management plan, and we're starting to reach the point where um, projects are being identified, alternatives are being reviewed. Um, decisions will be made that, uh, about what the plan in the future is going to look like on the wastewater side. So um, this task nine report, which everyone's had for a little while, starts to identify problem areas that Kleinfelder has sort of found through their evaluation of our system. Um, they've identified problem areas in the collection system and in the, at the plant and come up with review of alternatives to solve some of these problems, sort of order of magnitude costing on what some of the projects would, would be, what the solutions might be. Um, so this is really getting to the heart of the comprehensive plan. And the next task, when we get done with this, will be to prioritize all the work that's in here. There's like $66 million worth of work describing the collection in the, in the treatment plan. So, um, some of these may not happen in our lifetime. A lot of them probably should happen soon in the next several years, particularly at the plant. Um, so getting the board um, kind of bought into the process of what the problems that are going to identify what they are, what the alternatives are, what some of the costs are. The next big step after this is coming up with that multi-year capital plan in terms of the things that we really feel need to get done. Um, we've had sort of inform informal discussions. I was just talking to John the other morning about, you know, what it, when you see the value of all the work, you realize that it, all the work probably will not get done. Mm -hmm. So you really need to start focusing in on what is essential, what is affordable, um, when can we do the projects that need to be done, in what order, what year, what's the impact on the rates. Um, are some of the projects identified in here, will they ever be done? Are they, ne are they truly necessary? And we talked a little bit um, yesterday. I had John went through his files and made some copies of different regulatory correspondence. You might get asked for sort of a, a summary of things about the regulatory environment. A lot of times before communities spend tens of millions of dollars on their wastewater system, usually they have a large regulatory hammer over their head in terms of a consent order or other some some other um, document that requires upgrades to systems to resolve non-compliance issues. Our non-compliance issues for the most part have been fairly minor. Um, we don't have any consent order type things with large capital plans required to solve problems. Um, and we don't see that necessarily changing unless things totally fall apart to the point of being um, unmanageable. So while we're on that topic, um, do we have permit violations routinely? Discharge permit violations? I would say not routinely. No, they're sometimes seasonal, seasonable, or there's equipment failure, but uh, maybe one or two a year. Okay. So, I'd, and and what happens when we have those violations from the regulatory agencies? Do well. They, if it's a chlorine uh, uh, residual, it's like we're a little high on our residual. We yeah. write a letter to DEP and to EPA telling them that we have had a uh, a high an exceedance in chlorine residual, yeah. and that we have uh, we identify the problem and we resolve it, and we tell them what we have done. <coughs> and we don't dechlorinate, do we? No, we don't. Okay. 
So well, we do we, we do chlorinate, out. but yep. we have uh, one milligrams per liter. If we go like one point. All three or so, yeah. we have to write a letter. Okay. And then what we do is we make sure we make the adjustment and come down. Sometimes we have uh, just some changes, just a cha change in day of uh, sampling, we have to notify them there. That's not a violation, but there's also BOD violations mm -hmm. and t uh, t uh, total suspended solid yeah. vol violations, and that yeah. could be uh, a, a heavy rainstorm or sure. it could be a malfunction with equipment where. Uh, certain equipment, uh, certain flows didn't get where they were supposed to be during the process. Okay. So, it, it, this all gets around to, at least in my mind, one of, one of the things I'm struggling with is, is how badly is the plant impacted by high flows? And we know that, that, that things get flooded and, I don't mean to minimize it at all, but I'm wondering, it sounds like there are times when we have high flows and we still meet our permit. And maybe other times we, we have an exceedance. That's true. Flows. We could have a high level flows coming into the plant, uh, which would be, we're, we're designed for 8.6 and, and then the, uh, there was a 15 due to the upgrade supposedly. Okay. Yeah. And we could have a perfect uh, record, but then there could be that one storm where the uh, the blankets get lifted up out of the secondary clarifiers, yeah. and due to the fact that it is a sampling day, we could have a TSS violation. I see. And you have to write the letter. And so we don't sample. We don't report every day. Sample and report every day. No, we yeah. we take all the data every day, but yeah. we sample twice a week. Yeah. And if it happens on those days, then it happens on those days. You, that's our responsibility. Okay. okay. But as the files I provided for Jim, if you look through them, there's it's pretty minimal what you're looking at over the last few years. I, 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 I believe great. I gave from 2008 to the present. Yeah, it's amazing. It's nothing, nothing what you might expect. I think that's really commendable, by the way. It's a. It's managed to do that. It's a. I think it's normal for a, the file. Mm -hmm. To have these things in them, yeah, because every, everybody is subject to the the uh, the impacts of weather or or to equipment. I think the thing that's remarkable is that there's a lot of plants of this vintage that <coughs> aren't so well run and have a lot more have have exceedances that are that much more problematic. That would be my reaction. So uh, on the uh, on the sanitary on the sewer collection side, uh, there was a summary. Actually, had Doug McDonald updating it for me, but there was a summary in Task Six about, um, or Task One actually, about existing conditions of sanitary sewer overflows. So the number of times we have sewage released to the environment because of a blockage in a pipe, and there, you know, those those things happen um, several times a year because of grease or roots or other types of problems. Um, we've had a lot lately. As Nick can probably attest, he's probably been signing a lot of forms to report to DEP and. I think my only observation about that is that, um, and the, the state's response generally is, you know, okay, what was the problem, how are you taking care of it, that sort of thing. But we've had quite a few of them, and it, I, I think the, the appropriate question would be are we maintaining the sewer systems in a, in a way that's as effective as it can be? I think mm -hmm. that's a, probably an honest question. And some of the systems that we feel we need to, to implement to run the collection system better would probably improve some of our performance in those areas where you have a history of grease blockage or other types of things and those are the thing those are the areas that you need to hit more you know with more frequency to prevent a, a reoccurrence but sometimes we'll have an SSO at a location and then the guys will fix it and the big oh yeah this happened three years ago and we haven't really been out here since well that's I would say that would probably be a failure on our <coughs> part to to maintain that part of the system so um, in one of the one of the uh, earlier in that task one I mentioned, um, client builder started to plot on a map <coughs> where some of the CSOs have happened since 2005. Mm -hmm. I think it would be fruitful to up update the map to uh, you know to the current time because we've had a lot of different um, SSOs. Of course, not a lot, but I would say several since their draft of that task came out over, over a year ago. Or so, um, so you know, an old system problems with with maintaining it. It would be interesting to see which ones are related to maintenance and reduced pipeline capacity as opposed to 
um, a relatively clean pipe and we've exceeded the capacity? You know, because there, I guess there's a classic one, is it, it's up off of King Street or Barrett, Barrett, Street. Barrett Street? Is that, <coughs> is that overflow frequently? Only during heavy rainstorms, really heavy rainstorms. Really heavy rainstorms, okay. Caused by inflow. Right, by right, right. And pipe capacity and the fact that there's a siphon underneath the Barrett Street Brook there too. But even in that case, DEP apparently isn't being aggressive to make us fix it. That's what I'm gathering. That would be a fair assessment. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think you're right, your opening comments are right, that one of the challenges the board's going to have is we all, we all know the systems have to be fixed, you know, and as I read through the report, I mean, I, I, could, I could recognize the need to fix everything identified in the report, but the challenge is deciding how much we raise the rates to cover the repairs and how we can justify it. Um, and it's, we got to find a spot in there somewhere where we're, we're fixing enough to be responsible and maintain the system, but certainly we can't do everything, I'm sure. So that's going to be the hard part about sorting through this. Yeah, I mean, some of the collection projects are pretty, pretty rich. I mean, the one on King Street, solving that sewer problem on King Street, <coughs> you know, I think it was like a $10 million project or something. Right. Um, to me, I haven't, I haven't started to prioritize the projects that are in there, but when I look at the plant, you know, to me, the plant picking away at those priorities at the plant really are, are a priority because that plant is at the point of everything needs to be upgraded and, and improved. So uh, those would, to me, would be the projects that would end up coming to the top and being done sooner than later. And, a project, and some of the other larger collection projects, <coughs> like, you know, those might be years down the road. Or, but some of the inflow, some of the inflow work is interesting. You know that you can study it and figure out what the problems are. But then the fix is what, what's always a killer when you start right. racking up millions of dollars of anticipated construction costs to solve it. It's also the King Street um, separation project would be would take a few years, I think, and it would be a construction site in the midst of a very busy, busy um, main commercial strip in the city for, I think it would be very disruptive, but uh, I, as I recall from looking at this, which is now probably, like, seems like a year ago, um, that seemed like a, as far as getting stormwater out of our collection system would be a, that would go a long way which would then take the load off the plant. Yeah, or at least make the plant uh, yeah. operate sort of with less spikes. The peak flows are interesting at the plant because for the most part, they're, they're well managed and we don't have too many problems with them. If I can say that, John will correct me whenever I'm wrong here. You didn't torch that badly. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, but the, you know, the, the reverberation in the engineering study is you know, they've assumed a 35 MGD peak flow for lack of better information. And we've talked about that being probably unrealistically high. But you can see when you look at the projects, it ends up impacting the sizing of everything. Mm -hmm. Everything needs to be a little bit bigger and everything to handle this theoretical peak flow. Um, and I think that peak flow we really need to get a better handle on before we design anything. But I think the point is that because we have so much inflow, and the fluctuation inflow the, in the plant is so large that you know it's a, it's a much larger window than a normal plant might have in terms of the, the hydraulic capacities that are needed. Usually, you have your design flow and your peak flow on there, you know, the, the three times. Or something. Yeah, something like that. <coughs> not, you know, where we are, five or six or whatever times. Um, so it has an impact on the design of the plant as you go to improve as you go to design improvements to each process. Everything is subsequently sized a little bigger and done a little bit different, differently because of the hydraulic um, loading requirements. Um, so I think Kleinfelder's general thought, at least early on, was you know you should try to get rid of some of the inflow, and I do think that makes sense. But if the inflow removal involves spending 
10 million bucks or something, then you have to start wondering whether that's really the place you want to spend your 10 million. Or do you want to take the 10 million and just rebuild a quarter of the, you know, a third of the plant processes and, and, and do it there? Because it's unlikely that you'll be able to do everything. Do you see new mandates coming down from DEP regarding II and taking it out of the system? Well, I mean, there hasn't been. I wouldn't say new initiatives, but when they see, when they see and review the CD, uh, CWMP when it's done, um, whether they'll. I mean, will, I don't think there'll be any, any universal sort of across the board. We're going to crack down on II, but when they look at a community-specific problem, they might suggest that we do better. Our problem is the opposite of the CSO. You know, everything goes to the plant, and we don't have we don't have the uh, you know combined sewer overflows, which is really a red red flag for the for the regulators, and that's really a driver for a lot of communities to spend a lot of money. So it's it's interesting because ours, for the most part, goes to the plant. I think the regulators have not been overly aggressive in telling us we need to get the inflow out of the collection system. Sort of like it's not the problem is not as great, I guess, from that standpoint. Well, if we if our discharge meets permit almost all the time, I mean, they've got other fires to worry about. And it's just not a big deal. Right. The, the problem, I, I I agree with what you 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 just summarized, but it's it just seems backwards to postpone the inflow issue. And build capacity, yeah. but I I don't see why. It's that big ticket price, and and there's no shortcut. There's no doing a quarter of the project and removing a quarter of the inflow. You can't do that. You either do the whole King Street project, or you do none of it. I think. I mean, other, you know, and maybe it makes sense. You'd have to spend money on doing more sewer evaluation work. But if you could, if you did more sewer evaluation work and you could find some low hanging fruit on, on inflow removal, maybe that would maybe that would help at the plant. It's a little hard to quantify exactly how effective it would be. And and the key to inflow removal is you need another place to discharge it. And and chances are the inflow is going into this pipe because there is no other place to put it in many cases. But the, what was discussed was converting the existing sewer in, into a storm drain. Right. So the flow channel would still be there. Yeah. If you did the whole project, that's yeah. what you do. And that's why I'm saying that you probably can't just pick away at some of the sources of inflow because there may not, might be a real challenge to find a place to direct it other than into the pipe. You might, oh, have, yeah. you might have to build a second pipe and then you're starting to do the project as envisioned somehow. Actually, if you look over the past, say, eight to ten years, uh, the amount of inflow that we've been seeing has actually been coming down from the small projects that have gone on throughout the city and replacement of line here and there. Um, like probably about 15 years or so back, we actually saw a flow come in that was estimated at 26 million gallons one day. And uh, I would have to say over the last few years, what we've seen because of the work that's been done, you know, a little remedial work here and there to, to address small problems, that the, uh, the overall high flows that we've been seeing are much, much less than they were, say, 10 or 15 years ago. So it's not like, you know, we're at a standstill or anything and we just ignored it. Um, the, uh, going along that same line, the Hinkley Street project in Bay State Village where we put it off for a year because, in part because of neighborhood uh, disagreement possibly, but it was, I guess the realization that there was an opportunity to, to separate some stormwater, or, or to uh, actually, it wasn't it wasn't to remove stormwater from the collection, the sewer collection system. Relieving it, was to it from Elm Street relieving Brook. it from uh, the storm <coughs> collection system and getting it into a uh, basically to the river more directly. Right. And and possibly what I liked about that was that there was an opportunity to to uh, still it first. 
because there's that sandbar. I think it's a sandbar. Maybe it's natural, but that's where the uh, dam used to be for the old wire right. mill. And um, it seems like there's a there's sort of a uh, an existing detention area, which was, I believe, the, the head race for that mill. That just seemed like a great um, improvement for that, <coughs> that area, that project, and then to relieve some pressure on the on the storm system, not sewer. But you know, if there's places where we could do that, which King Street isn't, <laughs> there is no such place like that on King Street. Um, I, I think you're right. It, it, the little projects add up. So maybe it would be worth looking at that from an economic um, you know, implementation standpoint that would be um, affordable and, and practical to sort of chip away at the edges before we would try to tackle something like King Street and all the while work at the plant because that's, mm -hmm. I agree, that's, that's where it all goes. It has to work. Do we think there are a lot of sump pumps in the city? <coughs> Do we have any idea? Probably. I know there's well, quite a few. <laughs> and I think for the most part they're being discharged appropriately. Oh. I'm just wondering in that State Street, King Street area, that interceptor seems to be installed during the right down the low spot. Right. And I just wondered if those houses in some place. That's what the original sewer channel was, was where that pipe is. Yeah. yeah in open sewer? Yeah. Back in 1888, 1889. Mm -hmm. Those are easier to maintain, aren't they? Yeah. You should, maybe you should go back to that. Yeah. Well, there are some that would <laughs> suggest that we do just that. Yeah, absolutely. Bioswales and... Bioswales. Uh, what are they called? Uh, I forget what they're called. Oh. A little pre treatment. So, I was interested to hear your comment, Jim, that you think the 35 MGD that Kleinfeld is using is probably on the high side. So, that, that's comforting. Actually, I was, I was concerned that the number might possibly be higher, and, and what do we do if we make improvements and then find out that they're not big enough? Which, in, in either case, I think we need to give some thought to that flow metering that you were yeah. talking about. And I can see now our, at least finishing up the report probably at 35 is maybe okay, but before we do any projects, we need to have a better understanding of what the real number is. Yeah, I think so. The 35 is just, I just, you know, I kind of hate the number because it's not a real number. And mm -hmm. it's an educated guess on their part about what they think a, a reasonably conservative peak flow number would be. Yeah. But it's not based in reality, and it, and it does find its way. This is a planning study, and I don't think it's too hard to have a conservative number in there for the purposes of what they're doing, but clearly it would all be more comfortable if we knew what that number would be. And I don't know if you have any thoughts about it, John, what, uh, you know, anecdotally what you think that flow might be. I think your sense is that that 35 might be might be too high as well, right? But I think it's, a, it's not... It's not a, re a real number. Mm -hmm. I think uh, I think more so a 22 million or a 20. Let's go as high as 25 million mm -hmm. would be more realistic. Mm -hmm. But 35, I don't know where they get it. I don't know how they calculate it. But if we had 35 million coming in on us, we would be an inland lake, mm -hmm. and it would be a, a letter I'd have to write saying we've had some water come into the plant and take yeah. us completely out. Yeah. Didn't that happen in the 1990s with the hurricane? We had we had a big flow come in to the treatment plant at one time where it was a lake, but we had <coughs> every manhole in the city was blowing off. The rain was coming down and, and torrent torrents. The the outside holding water area at the plant that was a, a lake, and we had the flood control on full bore and. Uh, we did have some substantial damage to the plant at that point in our lower lower levels, yeah. but mostly due to the fact that we had uh, a link seal failure mm -hmm. at once, where once on a 
three three floors down in the ground uh, are, are where our screw pumps were a link seal for a sump pump fail and that filled up the basement yeah. yeah but those things happen so infrequently you, you can wait a long time for that to happen well, it's, not, it's not a rain to lose that happened over a course of eight hours or something this is a big, a big I think it was event. a big event, and it just was cumulative over the course of every day. Something going further and further on. Mm -hmm. we, we just recently, we had over two inches of rain in Northampton over the just just recently. Yeah. We had no, we didn't have any problems at the wastewater treatment plant. Yeah. We've noticed that when we do have problems, it's when you have a heavy rain, basically centered in the center of town. Mm -hmm. downtown area yeah it hits all at once that water's all released yeah. and, all hard and, and it all happens yeah. within about 45 minutes yeah. we do have the ones where they climb like the two incher just recently we climbed a little past 10 million but it wasn't an issue we could handle it nicely and we're and we're down on a piece of a couple pieces of equipment too which would have mm -hmm. made it easier for us but we managed to get through mm -hmm. so this 35 million gallons is I think it's a fantasy. Okay. Well, I can almost picture how a consultant will pick a number like that because yeah. you, you could criticize the little for making it too big. You get killed if you make it too small. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah. you pick your poison, yeah. and uh, it's the safe place to be. And and for planning, it's probably, as you said, just fine. Yeah, I think it's okay. Yeah. You know, and, and I think they're suggesting too that before you do any project, like any of these, any of these <coughs> types of studies, before you do any project, you, you've got to get better data and look at things in a lot more detail. But at, at some point, we need to nail down the basis of design for any improvements, and it's got to be accepted by whoever needs to accept it before we spend any money. Um, I had a question. What's the what's the pumping capacity of the of the uh, stormwater pump station? 150,000 gallons a minute, with three pumps running. Does that help you? No. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking millions of gallons per day. So uh, 150,000 gallons a minute. I can't do that in my head. I buy, uh, It'll be a million and a half every 500, 10 minutes. 300 mg. That's all going on. But of course, that's strictly storm, so it's, that's a very different animal. Probably a lot more uh, potential yeah. for water. So really <coughs> completely disconnected from the, the 20 to 35. Yeah. yeah. Well the, day. well, the only connection is that the Connecticut River is so high, the effluent pumps can't run after a certain stage, and that's what they do. They use the pump station to get the sewage out of the plant. He, he's just trying to compare the 35 number to something yeah. related to the, well, the capacity of the pumps. Well, right? the thinking was, so if we removed some of the stormwater out of the collection system, how would that impact the stormwater system? In particular, it would be those pumps, right? If we're talking about King Street, then that stormwater is going to end up at the pump station. And I, what the numbers tell me is that if, if even if we remove five million gallons a day, it's not going to impact the pump right. station at all. Sure. It's right. going to be nothing, a little extra water. Because the, treat the wastewater treatment plant effluent gets pumped directly to the river. It goes out on gravity, yeah. from the wastewater treatment plant out to the river. Yeah. As soon as the Connecticut River, hydraulically, re affects us, then we can pump it out. <coughs> Excuse me. And but directly, we, not. Directly, and yeah. if we can't pump it out directly, then we open a valve and it goes right before the, the flood control station and we use their pumps to pump it out. Okay. So that was the comment that our wastewater effluent pump station can't pump against every level of the river. At a certain point, it, it will get slower and slower. But at the same time, when we're in that zone where yeah. we have to use those effluent pumps. Yeah. Those effluent pumps can still be pumping, but we still at the same time can be dropping off into the uh, into the old Mill River uh, drainage okay. ditch. 
So some of the flow might go directly to the river and it's some into the ditch? Because it's just going to get harder and harder yeah. to pump yeah. against the head. Yeah. So that reduces your flow leaving. Yeah. So you're backing up, you open up the valve, it goes into the, before the flood control system. Now we fire, now we activate the flood control and now they pump it. Yeah. 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 Interesting. But it has to get up pretty high. Right. So in the absolute worst conditions, we add wastewater flow to the flood pump station flow. Treated wastewater yep. flow. Yeah. yeah. Treated. It's been chlor it's been chlorinated. Record. Yes. Sir. <laughs> That's a good so, point. Yeah, hundred percent of it gets treated under all conditions. Yes. Yes. To, to In some capacity, if, right. but it gets treated. So, anything that leaves the treatment plant has been dosed with chlorine, which kills the pathogens. Right. Right. We call that outfall number two. We have. That's where the water would go. Okay. Prior to the flood control. Yep. Okay. of the flood control pump station is that the Corps wants us to do calculations to check the capacity of the pumps to make sure that the, the model the amount of inflow coming in can be handled by the capacity of those pumps. That was something we had talked about and you had raised in the past because of change in land use and the increase in intensity of rainfall, does the flood control pump station have the capacity that it needs? We, we don't know. Since it was designed in 1938 or something, <laughs> exactly. there's a chance that enough has changed that it isn't adequate. There's like a 700 acre <clears throat> drainage area, I think. Yeah. That's all that is hitting that plant is 700 yeah, I think acres? There's 700 some acres. 770. 770, was it? I think it was. It's not one of the Army Corps plans. Oh. But what, what has really changed on the, the Northampton side of the dike system in the last 40, 50 years where what has been really added besides a, besides a big development in industrial park? Mm -hmm. the, the town really hasn't, in the core, the core part where the drainage is, it hasn't really changed. Smith College hasn't really changed too much. Downtown hasn't changed with, with the practices of what's been going on. Mm -hmm. And the only real change has been uh, some asparagus fields over an industrial park that is now an industrial park and there is drainage. And maybe some of the King Street development. Awesome. I do. Some of the big dealership lots and stuff. But parking everywhere. Parking has increased in yeah. 75 years. Yeah. <coughs> Even the, the new parking lot, certainly the ones that were just built, have, have to have their own, uh, at least detention systems. I don't know what the soil conditions are like up there, but maybe they're even the filtration systems. Yeah, but, but, but they're designed for the 100 year storm. And so when we need them to perform the most, they're probably at capacity. You know, they're helping, but yeah. they're at they're at capacity because the, the storms that, I mean, we now get 100 year storms every other year. So, um, I, I bet it certainly helps, but it probably doesn't take care of the whole issue. Well, I was thinking that, in, in, I think of a Cole Morgan site, there's, there's got to be a, an improvement. <coughs> Cole Morgan, I oh, doubt, had any a, collection at all, or any right. uh, um, detention yeah. whatsoever, and yeah. those car dealerships have got to have sure. something. That's right. I'm sure they do. I'm sure they do. Yeah, good point. What was Cole Morgan there in 38? I don't think so, but I'm sure when they paved their entire site, the water just runs off and goes right into the collection sure. system. I don't sure. think there was any detention yeah. whatsoever. Yeah.
And I know that uh, starting with the parking garage at Smith, which was 2000, that has a, an infiltration system in every other sizable project following that. Mm -hmm. uh, Fort Hall has a very elaborate uh, detention system. Um, um, not much in the way of infiltration, but uh, detention. Campus Center has a great infiltration system. Uh, and that was previously in a parking lot that had nothing. Mm -hmm. And now that, that water is uh, collected, leached back into the ground. And um, I would say most of the time, the water coming off that roof never makes it to the pond. Mm -hmm. But that's where the water goes. And I'm not sure that the parking lot water would have gone in that direction. I really don't know where it went. Mm -hmm. I think it went out onto Elm Street. So, yeah. I mean, it's, it's all small <laughs> stuff. But yeah. going back to what you said, I, it's made a noticeable impact. Yeah, it's amazing the, the little steps you can take and how it accumulates over time and, and in the end you end up with uh, a large gain from, from all the little small projects that are going on around the city. Okay. So on the collection system, do we look at uh, the high-risk sewers as a priority need, such as the Federal Street sewer, where we had got the stone retaining wall that we repaired once already, things are 30 inch diameter line? If that old hundred year old retaining wall fails, we lose that sewer, is that because that would create quite a, a uh, SSO on that. We look at the Barrett Street as a smaller drainage area that we might be able to provide some relief to the King Street sewer also by eliminating that II. Just coming from that neighborhood up in the Prospect Avenue area. I'm not sure what the board wants to prioritize out of this, but maybe you take some of these smaller projects just to take the risk off the facilities later on in life. If we know the King Street project, a $10 million, pro I mean, that's a huge project. And very disruptive. Right. That would be very hard to construct. Yeah, I was interested in, in the system that Kleinfelder used to prioritize the collection system projects. And that was why I was just sort of <coughs> curious more than anything to see see the formula and how they factored everything together and I've done nothing that specific but similar ways to try to prioritize projects and you can play with the weightings and the factors that you use and make and and change the results a little bit and, uh, and that's was sort of why that was in my thinking when I asked for that then to explain that when I came but I agree, Ned. We need to look at look at these ten projects that were identified and try to get a sense for you know apply our own risk analysis to them somehow and figure out which ones we can go to the public and say we really need to spend the money and take care of this project because mm -hmm. and uh, you know your argument for Federal Streets uh, is a good one. I if, if that's truly at risk, then uh, we can probably, for much less money, take care of it now than if it fails. Exactly. Whereas King Street, you know, I'm not sure there's a cost benefit there. Even if we took care of it, I'm not sure we we recover the ten million dollars in the future. You know. So that's why I was looking at Bear Street. Is there an outlying area that? We might be able to achieve something reasonable um, right. if you just put the new cross country line and that doesn't take the IEI out of the system. So we look at some of these discrete areas, and that's why I asked the question earlier is there any new regulations coming down that's going to require us to really actively deal with IEI going forward besides submitting an annual report of what we've done in the past year? We've just been in the status quo for the past eight, ten years now. Yeah. Number two choice on here was, was uh, just King looking Street. at that, Dave. Okay. And, and if, um, if King Street was done, it seems to me it, it eliminates number two, state two altogether. Yeah. Don't have that. Is, that, is that one of the ones that was handed out 
It came with task seven. Oh, okay, so I don't have that on this one. I think that was one of the handouts that was <coughs> misplaced it. Um, I don't know how we should best spend our time this morning. Should we go through the treatment plan issues? Because that those have not been prioritized at this point. I don't think anything has been prioritized. Well, well, I call this a, this is an attempt yeah, to. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I would say we could uh, we could talk about those projects at the plant since we have Jim and John here. Yeah. Um, we could probably elaborate more than I can. The goings on at the plant, but clearly there were a number of you know it's almost it's it's every process from from the headworks through disinfection and everything in between. Uh, I think that's discussed in in the document. Are there increased requirements down the road that we can see coming, whether it's one year or ten years away? Well, it's the only one that we're really generally aware of is a potential reduction in nitrogen um, that can be discharged from the plant. But we don't, we're not actually anticipating that for, for a few years at this point. But it's likely eventually. Uh, or, or might it's probably we never reach that I don't know. plateau. I don't know. Part of the problem is, is until they give us some sort of a number to work from, it's hard to, to design anything. Oh. Yeah. Or for what you can take out, and if you go and try and anticipate them, guaranteed it'll be wrong. Right. Because the, the, your number is changing all the time. So I mean, they've basically told us to keep the amount of nitrogen in a constant, the, the amount of annual nitrogen discharge to a constant amount, but that that hasn't turned into a discharge permit one or anything. Mm -hmm. Although plants further down in Connecticut and in, in in Connecticut, and New York have. Discharge limits for nitrogen. Uh, but we haven't seen those. And that's talked about in here in terms of you know, holding off on some uh, types of additions to secondary treatment until you really know what the discharge permit limit's going to be. Mm -hmm. We've done some optimization work um, at the plant based on some client bill that did a really nice study with us a couple of years ago. And John and the guys at the plant have, you know, modified the way that we've run the secondary process and we've reduced the nitrogen. And I think that I thought that was a really successful project. Doing something with a very old plant um, mm -hmm. was actually I was kind of amazed at how successful it was. Mm -hmm. And as you went through the projects for the plant, John, when you look. If you just look at the executive summary, which I think is probably a pretty good, you know, it gets to the meat of what they're recommending at the plant. Are there things that when you when you went through it, John, you're like, oh yeah, that that is something that should happen now, and then another project where you look at it and say, well, why the heck would we ever want to do that? Did, did you have that sort of reaction to the different projects that were identified? In there? I had a couple reactions to the. Um, we, we're, we're going to need to do something with the dewatering equipment. The, uh, the client so which one is that, John? Um, it would be, they were, was, well, it's a, it's a, it's a scenario of dewatering, de, dewatering uh, A3A. Page, ni page 19 in the, in the executive summary, 19 to 23. Oh, oh, There's a there's a table here E5 on page eight. Yeah, yeah, that's it's listed there as the replace existing dewatering equipment, de watering equipment with a new dewatering technology. What is that? T dash do. <coughs> yeah, T do. A T do. A T do. It's a T do project. We need to find one of those. Right. Never heard of one, but we could sure use one for three million dollars. Yeah. 
Well, that one stood out. The, the, the reason why is because we right now have two um, belt filter presses. One is very old. It's one of the original ones we installed ourselves. And getting parts for it now is becoming, um, it's not becoming, it is almost impossible mm -hmm. to get certain parts for it to, to, to work properly. Yeah. And the only other way, alternative, to keep this piece of equipment running is to get a hold of Ashbrook, which is a company out of Texas, and come in and refurbish the whole piece of equipment from top to bottom with instead of uh, pneumatics, it would be hydraulics. And therefore, you have this company coming up. Either they come up or they say, send our press down. And the cost is going to be pretty exorbitant as far as, I don't know the cost, but it will be exorbitant for these people to redo up an old press. How do you send them a press when you, it's not I'm, like you can... I just threw it out on the table because I don't know if the technicians can come up and just order parts and start fixing it, or they say, send your stuff down. It can go on the back of a tractor trailer and head south. So we must have some other capacity to dewater. Them. Yes, we have two. We have two filter presses. Okay, so, so they would be down to one. Well, that's what I mean. Yeah, so it, so uh, it seems like there'd be some risk there. Yeah, there there is risk right now in case the uh, the filter press decline does have another malfunction yeah. with one of its pneumatic valves. I, I used to get them readily uh, stateside. Then they started sending the for, to Germany to get them. And then the last run Jim and I had trying to find them, which was like three months, about two months ago, uh, they're unavailable. <coughs> and they sent us some uh, equivalent, which is doesn't even fit. Wow. So we're sort of on a wing of prayer with that press. If we're looking at the dewatering, we should start thinking of an alternative uh, uh, method, which would be either the centrifuges, which they suggested, or uh, the, the rotary, cone fill, uh, rotary cones which would be the Fourniers, which would take a more of a capacity and give us the, the um, give us the solids that we're looking for in there. They're suggesting in here solids up to almost 30 percent and right now we're doing 22 and if we can get the solids up higher then we can it will be a, a more economical uh, viable solution for the city in, in sludge dewatering and sludge handling. So that has to be looked at a little uh, more. I'm, I'm, I'm hone in on that one a little bit more. Sure. I assume that you want to build more redundancy in the system too at the same time if we go with something new or a new process. Yes, uh, if we look at, if they looked at the suggestion that they said for uh, uh, centrifuges, if one centrifuge, they, I think they said maybe two, but if one goes down, you lose your capacity to dewater on two pieces of equipment, so you're down to one. <coughs> we, we, Jim and I have been speaking and looking at the Fournier rotary, rotary cones, I guess you're called, and what happens, they come in a, in a bank of like, you can get them like four or five in a bank, and if any part of that cone needs maintenance, there's five separate parts, you take one offline, and you can still keep dewatering in some capacity. Yeah. And uh, so, it has to be looked at there. Anything that you, any new system that's going to be put in has to be designed with adequate redundancy. Right. The, no matter what it is. The other part of the dewatering system has to be uh, addressed is the, the conveyance system for the sludge to the boxes. The current one now is hanging off the ceilings. We just, um, we just missed the bullet recently because we had to scavenge a part off of one part of the conveyor system to add it to a, another part that failed. Uh, that unit is very impossible to work on. In case a screw or a bearing or something goes wrong, mm. you have to just about shut the system down. Wow. So that had... The, the centrifugal or the centrifuge dewatering equipment, did that take up would you get uh, the same capacity using less space um, than the belt filter press? I know that the building is, you know, it's a sizable building. In the past, we had centrifuges. Oh. We, we had Ingersoll uh, ran centrifuges, and they ran quite well for, for years. And we got uh, pretty good solids until we started adding WAS, which was the, uh, the secondary system sludge. And then it started getting more watery as we went on. 
Uh, we beat them up pretty good because we were working five days a, a five days in overtime every night, mm -hmm. trying to keep up with the uh, existing bottling plant that was in the tank of the town, Atlantic Canners. Mm -hmm. uh, you can get the solids out of a centrifuge, but <coughs> I think we had three of them or four. Um, I think three. We had three of them. Three of them. So we would have all of them running at the same time, but I know the technology's changed with them. Mm -hmm. There's uh, a high energy cost of running a centrifuge, because uh, obviously you're, you're spinning the equipment up pretty good to, uh, right. to get your process to work. Um, the Fournier press that uh, John was talking about has a much, much lower energy cost, so you got to sort of balance, you know, how much is it costing you to do your dewatering right. um, electrically and also how much mechanical uh, uh, repair work has to go in. Because obviously centrifuges are, are um, can be much more delicate, you know. I mean, if they're not um, properly balanced and maintained and stuff like that, uh, they can uh, break down fairly rapidly. So, what do we do for grit removal? Because that used to be a problem with centrifuges and cost well, with, to wear. With, with our grit removal, we we collect it in the headworks. Yeah. And we currently have contracts where once the sludge is dewatered and in the boxes. Yeah. We come up with a forklift and a hopper, and we dump that grit right into the smoke. So we have aerated grit removal. Aerated grit removal with and with rag collection, yeah. and that that gets put in with the sludges that get hauled out. Right now, it's being landfilled. The new contract will probably be incineration. And <coughs> do we have any sense for how effective it is? The headwork. No, the room. The, the efficiency of the grit removal system. Uh, I'll, yeah. and Not as efficient as we'd like it to be. Yeah. We, we do find after high flows that we do have some grit right through the whole system. Yeah. Yeah. It's, a, it's, it's an older type of system, mm -hmm. and, but it's, it's, a, it's effective in its own right. It, it's sometimes a lot of manual work. I think Chicopee went to a centrifuge a few years ago. They have one now. Do you know if they're happy with it? Uh, from what I understood from Mr. Shea, who's the head yeah. operator down there, they run some place, they seem to be pretty pleased with it. Good. And I didn't know if it was a big centrifuge with low electrical uh, demand or what. But I don't yeah. know what they have for redundancy. They make, I don't, I don't know either. Yeah, what you said about the, what intrigued me about the centrifuge is that uh, I can imagine that it might be able to handle more material with a smaller footprint. That's my guess. And I like the idea that they come in banks, in groups. Well, what's so you're not depending on one big machine that then what do you do when your flows are low in the middle of the night? Are you running that thing at a certain RPM that has to be at a certain speed and you're using all that energy or can you you back it down, it's only one of the things operating and not all four or whatever. Well, right now we're talking centrifuges and fourniers. The fourniers come in a bank, the centrifuges would be separate units. Okay. Yeah, I'm not familiar well, with the fourniers. Yeah, well, like it's that. like, it looks sort of like a, uh, like a nautilus animal, you know, the circle. Mm -hmm. And the sludge goes in, it goes through a, a, like a wedge plate, a, a screw in there. And then as slowly as it gets near the end, the sludge gets squeezed, the water gets removed, and it spits out or gets discharged. And are people around here using them, you know? We believe so. Okay. Uh, to answer your question about feed, we do have a holding tank, so we have to make sure that the holding tank has enough <coughs> sludge in it to feed these, to feed any apparatus that is dewatering sludge in the sludge process. So it's not like you can feed just a little trickle or you can feed a whole bunch. You'd like to be able to feed it a, a lot and have it dewatered properly. And that's that's your that's your give and take too. So it, it cycles. Right. You you collect and hold and store until you have enough to do a batch. Right. We have an eight thousand gallon tank. And we pump it from the thickener building to this tank. And that's and under the floor of the, this the is, presses. This up. is in the basement of the sludge process. Okay. And from there, we have piston pumps that pump that sludge upstairs to our belt filter presses. Okay, I, I remember that now, yeah. So it's not a, a batch. 
you can do batches, but you do a constant while you're dewatering heat, you're, you're feeding from your thickener building to the, the holding tank, and then from the transition tank, and then to piston pumps, then upstairs, mixed with polymer, and dewatered. Mm -hmm. No matter what you have upstairs, that would be probably the, the flow schematic for how sludge will get upstairs. Yeah. Which brings us another step back. What steps out <coughs> is going, I have two thickeners that I, they're constantly full. I have a hard time, very impossible time, to take one down and clean it and repair it, which in the dialogue in here, in the, in the, in the chapters in here, they suggested uh, we are looking for a new thickener added on to a third thickener. And they also added a, uh, a sludge holding tank in here. So as we look, the building that has the cow wall roof. The, yeah, <coughs> it's a little like fiberglass with black roof. Yeah, right. There's two thick, two little thickeners in there. Yes, and the sludges from the primary clarifiers and the sludges from the secondary sludges, primary sludge and waste activated sludge, secondary sludge get put in there and mixed. And over the course of a weekend, they get full. And you know, after they get full, it overflows its thickener and it goes back through the system, which means now it's getting treated again and it gets harder to dewater and treat as you keep going through the system. So that project to add gravity thickening and storage would be a priority in, in your mind? I would, I, would, the I would think I'd go with uh, another thickener. I don't know about the, sto the, the sludge storage tank, which they were talking about a rectangular tank with aerated they really find air bubblers. But the removal of the silo and cleaning that area out a little bit would be probably the place it would go. Uh, that's the graphic uh, where it says remove a demolished <coughs> line silo and install dedicated thickened sludge storage tank. Right. I'm I'm not too sure about this thickened storage tank, but I. We could really use another <laughs> small clarifier, right. a sludge thick, thickness. Jim, yeah. it's a little tricky finding your way from the summary of the projects to the text. Would you like a page number attached to it? <laughs> well, they do have a table of contents, but I'm trying to, because it looks like you're talking about project uh, GTS. Mm -hmm. And I, as you were talking, I was trying to find where they do. 146. 146, it's before, <coughs> before I'll do watering. Okay, going the wrong way. I'm, I'm sort of going backwards here. No, the, that's all right. The recommendation is also on page 19 of 23 in the executive summary. All right. The thing about the executive summary is it only talks about the recommended alternative. It doesn't have the three or four alternatives they may have looked at for thickening. So in a way, the executive summary is a little bit easier to look at because they pull out the recommendations there. But but they don't show the elements of the cost. Right. Which so when when John says we ought to add the conveyors. Right. I'm wondering if the conveyors are already in one of these numbers. The, and conveyor, so. the <coughs> conveyors are in the T2 project. Yeah, okay. You may have gleaned. I don't, yeah. mean, I don't mean to be flipping around. No, no, you're, you're, you're doing you fine. Know. It's 840. Yeah, the reports are there. I, and it, and it's, not a, it's not a criticism of Kleinfelder. It's just, it's a, it's, there's so much information here, it's difficult to present it. Um, and then summarize it, and different people want different levels of summary, so it's uh, So the, the, the conveyor part isn't the solid steel watering team project, the $3.7 million mm -hmm. job. But I guess the question, if you were to look at the breakdown for the, the, uh, the gravity thickening, whether John's suggesting that a storage tank isn't needed, I don't know what the cost, you need to kind of build on to to, uh, what, cost, what, what the cost breakdowns are on that. So they put in a new thickened sludge storage tank. What page is that again? 9 151. <laughs> 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 
The option they recommended is a new thickened sludge tank with aeration equipment and then upgrade the two gravity thickeners. So it's so it's not just a new tank, it's an upgrade of the whole storage system for three million dollars. And one of the things you have to be aware of is when we had the, the gravity belt thickener that was online and the two storage tanks, and those were aerated and there was the odor control system was connected to that. But because of the fact that the diffusers in the bottom were stirring everything up and liberating the gases, it actually exceeded the capacity of the uh, odor control system to draw it off. And so we had quite a few complaints from the neighborhood because there was an incredible odor that was just wafting across the neighborhood. Now those are those two <laughs> digesters that got converted, uh, existing digesters. So when, they, so when they mention a rectangular storage tank with uh, diffused air in it, all I'm picturing is now we have to add more equipment to take care of uh, aerosols mm -hmm. uh, that are being released into the uh, Whereas if you had a thickener, you wouldn't aerate it, you'd stir it. Stir it nice and, and slowly. And it would have fewer emissions. Exactly. And you could even put a chlorine you tank could, on You could top still put a, a duct in there to suck out yeah. the air that's in there, but yeah. as far as let's try not to disturb the beehive, <laughs> that's what's going on. You're stirring the pot. You know. Right. <laughs> right. So, back to dewatering. Can you survive with one press or what are your normal operations we right now we we use one press you do okay and um, once in a while the we newer to, one i would assume well actually it's the the older one because it's in a, it's in a location the, the one that can fall apart any day now got it it's in a location where the operators don't get covered with water when they wash it down and uh it's back in the room a bit and mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a two meter press as opposed to the new ones a 1.5 so it does okay it does produce a lot more a lot more cake okay uh we have survived on one mm -hmm. when we're doing repairs yeah yeah, yeah. and th at that point you're sort uh, of yeah but really crossing your fingers well, because if the second one goes you're done i have to go talk to ned about a serious circ circumstance <laughs> beyond my control so. are we set up for liquid Sludge disposal? We have done liquid sludge disposal in the past. Yeah. It was tanker trucks take only 4,000 gallons a piece. Yeah. And we do about 32,000 gallons a day, Jeff. Eight, eight trucks. Yeah. Eight trucks going through the neighborhood. Uh, winter operations were really bad guys showing up with frozen valves, uh, pipes going outside buildings. Uh, are the, the, the problems involved with that were pretty high. And and the cost is high to get rid of the stuff too. Yeah. yeah I I believe believe so. you're, you're yeah, trucking. Trucking out the But at least it's it's we're not left without any option if we lose both presses. Right. That's all. Oh no, you you, you you can run into an emergency, let's get some and you can deal with it in short it term. There are there is also a uh, portable presses that you can get a hold of and he, there's a group in Hatfield that still run, still does it, mm -hmm. but they need it more of a heads up than come on tomorrow. Right. Right. But you could go liquid until they showed up or something. Yes. If you had to. <coughs> we, we could try. Mm -hmm. We've had problems with the feed lines and. But we have we have storage and we can do it. The other issue here, Jim, that look, Kleinfelder, I guess rightfully so, has has identified all the costs for the planning period, which don't mean we need to spend them all on day one. So as I look at this storage option, GTS, they've got um, upgrades to the, the two existing gravity thickeners. And B 
because they know that'll have to happen at some point during the planning period. I don't know if it has to happen this year or in five years. I, so there may be a way to pick some of the elements of this option and proceed and not do everything, perhaps. I think that's be. true. I think the other part of it is that logistically, when you start looking at different components, it, logistically, it, it may be impossible to do certain things at the same time. Mm -hmm. So coordinating um, renovation work at the plant, I think, also includes you know, the, the physical limitations of the space. Yeah, the, we're very space constrained down there. Um, the underground, not only do you have to deal with the known underground piping, but there was also an existing plant there prior to the 50s, in the 50s, so you can dig down and all of a sudden hit a big concrete abutment. Oh, no and we've had that, in the, had that yeah. problem in the past, yeah. where it looks nice and diggable when the grass looks down. good. Yeah, because everything comes to a standstill. That's a good point, though. I think any of these types of planning studies, which <coughs> which group things together, every project. Once you start looking at every project, you know, once one's identified as a priority, you need to drill down to all the different components to figure out whether that is the project mm -hmm. in its entirety, or do you do part of it, or do you have to add something to it, or any of those things need to be weighed as you start moving into design for improvement. The same thing on the water side where things are identified, but if you look at them in detail, you don't know. Is that really the project that we want to do, or is it going to be something that's similar to that? Well, like on the storage one, it looks like they don't have anything for additional odor control. Right. Yeah, it's probably somewhere else in here, but right. what you got to recognize. So that's the only one that's really important. John? Well, I think we. I think you should look. <laughs> I think you should look at that one in a more serious note because if we can't do water sludge yeah. in an effective way, we're bas basically at a standstill. What What are the other ones? That, so that's a low hanging fruit, right? So that yeah, I can, I can pick that one. Uh, By the time we're done, they'll all be checked off. You know. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I wasn't too sure about the, uh, the the flight pumps. They're saying because of that 35 million gallons, they were talking about uh, changing out the flight pumps. Those are the lift pumps. Mm -hmm. um, Those are what, 10 years old? They're at least about 10 years old. And uh, they were talking about putting bigger pumps in there, uh, actual actual axial pumps in, mm -hmm. or extend, expanding the tank and adding bigger pumps. But then they came into uh, flow constraints on how to deal with the the amount of flow that comes into the plant at night because we have bas basically what I think is maybe uh, maybe a foot and a half of pumping area that you can yeah. pump down and it turns off you just can't put this monster pump in and then so they were saying let's make the pit deeper yeah. well to make the pit deeper oh you you've got to go through a water table that's out of, out of control down there and so you come into these digging issues, which we found out just to replace a valve one time was like close to fifty thousand dollars. So, well, and and so what happens? What happens if the flow exceeds the capacity of those pumps, or does the flow these days exceed the capacity? When those pumps cannot pump the flow that's going into them. The primary clarifiers act as holding tanks. And there's 12 feet of uh, free base in there, in those tanks. They're about 60, They're 70 deep, feet huh? wide. Yeah. yeah. And you have 12 feet of space per tank. So you, you, you do have a, a pretty good detention time there before it starts backing up into your headwaters. <coughs> and we've only seen the water come up in those clarifiers uh, maybe a couple times where it didn't overflow and I've seen it where it overflowed once very minimally and once where it's a lot. So, so that, that's a low priority, right? It is. So, so, the one, so the ones I'm looking at, I'm wondering, so the electrical infrastructure, plant-wide power back up 2.6 million, seems like that should be somewhere near the top and also um, getting rid of the chlorine disinfection system. I mean, you feel like that's a priority? Yes, I do. Yes. Like, 
what's going on there is that the the hazard that it presents not only to the people that are coming into the plant and working there they have no experience they need to be trained but also the, the chlorine itself it's it's eight two-ton cylinders for our two are online and two are in reserve if there's ever an issue there if the chlorine will drop you in a matter of seconds plus the gas depending on which way the wind goes it's going to go into the neighborhoods uh, there aren't many plants around here that still use gas, are there? Not that I know of. <coughs> right, right. I think that was done in the 70s. And, and uh, let's see, we, we do have a, because we have the chlorine, we have a driving RMP risk management program, which as just a, a, a tag on is just becoming a, a little bear in itself to run, to stay up with the, reg the regulations and the requirements. And we have three-year self-evaluation evaluations and five-year um, audits. audits. So, and, and they're becoming pretty pretty expensive uh, in, in the sense that three thousand for the self every three years, four thousand. Then comes the five-year one that could be close to ten if they find stuff going on with it. And there's we've already had one fine on it just on a, on a paper. Paper, paper violation. Yes, it was. It was a paper violation. So upgrading that is, is pretty important. Back over here. Just looking at that list on page eight in the executive summary is a good way to yeah. kind of take a look at everything. We've got four asters so far. So. Uh, Sludge storage, the dewatering, disinfection, disinfection, and, and electrical. Yep. And it's ten million dollars in projects right there. Communications is also something that's that's pretty important. Um, right now, the uh, the ability to communicate between the pump stations and the plant um, it goes across telephone lines. Mm -hmm. It's a very old technology, um, and we have had issues from time to time where basically the telephone equipment fails, and so if that happens, our alarm system is in failure. And trying to get uh, a telephone company out to uh, repair their equipment can be uh, problematical, um, especially since a lot of the older people who knew exactly where some of these lines went and stuff like that have retired and a lot of the newer people come in and they basically pull a piece of equipment on and say oh, it's your problem and then they walk away from it um, also the um, communication systems in the in the treatment plant right now we don't have the ability other than using our own cell phones there to let somebody know at the other end of the plant that there's an issue going on, say if there was a fire or a gas leak or something like that. Um, we're we're going to be working on all that stuff now that's going to fall outside of this plan, so it should be done before this plan will be done. Oh, all right. Okay. So so the, you, everything that you're mentioning, the, yeah. the communication. Remote stations, stations in within the plant? Yeah. 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 And is that different than this TPIC project? Yeah, or, or this is, is the same thing. No, this is SCADA. And this is yes. That's yeah. the, there's a, you were just they're just talking about communication. Yes, yeah, communication. Human right. the Human the, the, the putting the backbone system. in for SCADA yeah. and, and getting that ready. To okay. Go. okay. So the communication project isn't even on this list. No. no. Okay. But it's also funded this year. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That alongside that one, Jim, that's a, the water remediation <coughs> down cellar. That one's we put money aside for that one. So. Yeah, I know we put money. Apparently, aside. you're very persuasive. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you do. Or yeah, you're smart enough to pick small ticket price projects. <laughs> well, a lot of times, if you don't take care of the little details, I mean, I know. you yeah. set your up well, yourself up later for bigger problems. for a big fall. Yeah, and that's sort of the challenge we have: is all this stuff should be done, but <coughs> forty million dollars. 
we do have another project there, Jim, where we would like to have the, the, the wiring in the sludge process building go down from the ceiling and go to the prime, uh, go to the, uh, the waste pumps because of because of that wa uh, water coming up through the conduits where all our controls are and electrical condu conduit down there we need to have the wire so coming from the oh, ceiling. Do you have the same problem as in the control building as you do in the sludge process building too? Uh, sludge process? Water? No. 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 He meant the control building. I mean the control. Oh, okay. I mean, I mean the pump gallery the down control. there. Okay. So that, that, that should happen. I mean I've got a pump right now where an electrician doesn't even want to wire, it up, wire up a motor because you got this little box like this the wires are all coming out for the to hook them all up to run the motor over here but the water is gushing out and he's gone I'm not standing in the puddle of water and I'm not touching these wires even with them off yep. so that that should be a priority uh, a small priority project So there are some other, we've got some other projects here, clarifier, re replacing clarifier mechanisms and primary sludge pumps, doing some improvements at the headworks, um, upgrading secondary treatment processes. I mean, some of those are pretty large projects. existing buildings to meet code, reconfigure control building, building dedicated storage building. Yeah, we haven't touched any of the building issues. I know. The envelope issues. And there were a lot of them. A lot of code issues were identified. So maybe that's a situation that there's five million bucks there for that maintenance and control building project, but like you were suggesting a minute ago, Mike, maybe you need to drill down into that five million and prioritize the things that are in there to figure out what what needs to be taken. I mean, there was there was some there was some stuff identified in building envelope and code issues that they listed as a priority that should happen in the short term. But if you look at it as part of a five million dollar project, the tendency might be to delay a five million dollar project. But if you took a million dollars out of that, maybe that's something you feel what could be done next year or something, right? So how do you how, how do you prioritize all those things? Okay. And uh, it's not a lot of guidance in the cost estimate. It's just four four lines. What page is the final one? 182. It's not even. <coughs> is this the project you were talking about? MCB, because this has got a new building for sludge storage in it. I think it's the one before that. I mean, it's a control building on page 179. Well, they picked option A5B. Oh, are you on the A5A, oh, beyond that. Yeah, they picked A5B. A5B yeah. yeah. <coughs> so, control building updates at 1.2 million. We really don't know what's, well, it's probably in an appendix. That's what I'm wondering. Jumps out. But there again would be a situation where you'd want to look at those numbers and what we were doing and what the priorities were. There's a whole report on the on the building envelope issues. And it's pretty detailed, all the trades went through the buildings and you know different things were identified. 
Did they price it, do you know, or did they just? I think they may have put some pricing in there. I recall it's one of the earlier tasks. But some of it stuck out, like you should take care of this. You know, some things were it's pretty bad. Yeah. So they're saying that 5B is the same as 5A with the uh, addition of the storage building in that description. A5B, they're saying it's the same thing as A5A, which included new doors, rehabilitation space in the lab, additional office, more locker room, kitchen at, locker room, uh, EDA compliance, handicap ramps, plumbing, HVAC and electrical systems, fire alarm systems, sprinklers. And then 5B adds a storage facility. I think one was an expansion of the maintenance building, and the second one was a separate storage building. It was upgrading the existing maintenance building, which yeah. would include a 2700 square foot addition expansion yeah. versus a new building. Yep. So can we go th through this list briefly? Yeah. Um, the first one is uh, T wet, so to expand the hydraulic capacity of the facility. And without reading it again, it, it sounds like although the consequences to high flows, we don't <coughs> suffer immeasurably from them. So that might be a lower priority. I don't know if that's a fair. I think it might be. Um, I, th I think it would be a, a low priority. Secondary treatment. Um, stage stage one is to upgrade and optimize. Stage two must be nitrogen removal. It is. And they haven't priced nitrogen removal. So there's a $10 million price tag to upgrade and optimize. And without a history of compliance violations. Some portions of that would be a priority. I'd need to look at <coughs> 10 million in terms of yeah. aeration capacity. Um, I don't know what some of the other issues are. But I know, okay. I know, aeration capacity is, is something that would be a higher priority for us because we're, we're pretty much at capacity in terms of our ability to aerate. If the aeration uh, situation includes uh, the valving, we have valves in the aeration tanks at the bottom of the tanks. A lot of them are dysfunctional; they're open or closed. And when you try to open or close them, then you have. Uh, problems with uh, where they're anchored to in the concrete. The, the concrete now is 30 something years old. It's becoming, I, I would say, you can use the word punky. I'm not too sure if that's the right word for concrete. When it gets old, it can't hold. But you put a little pressure on a anchor inside the concrete and you will get cracks. So we've had to make some adjustments to put plates and secure more concrete to keep things where they are. The initial configuration of the uh, valving in the aeration tanks led it to be uh, difficult to work. You would come down on a shaft and you'd come to a knuckle, then go like four four feet to another knuckle, and then you'd go down into the into a, a, a valve that you needed to turn. So as you're turning here, this knuckle has to turn, this knuckle has to turn, then you turn your, your valve on or off. These things would rot, snap, and you'd have to. So the, break, the breakdown on, nine, on page 9-95 is biological treatment tank repairs, new return activated sludge, waste activated sludge, sludge, sludge pumps and BFDs, aeration system upgrades, blower building improvements, secondary clarifier upgrades, an allowance for installation of equipment, related electrical and controls, new secondary clarifier. That's, that, that's all of those things that add up to 10 million. So we might be able to look at 
prioritizing which of those are we could use new pumps we don't need new motors because we we've, we've got new motors we do have VFDs for uh, the primary and the RES so we want the uh, would want the aeration system upgrades too there right yes if you can get them because right now I believe if we have to take the aeration system down because there's four tanks we'd have to uh, eight tanks we'd have to take four down at a whack to do any work hmm. on any of the four tanks in a, in a row if you it's pretty tricky huh so you, hopefully you can get that isolated mm -hmm. so the four tanks are really one tank they, they, they function as one tank they overflow well, not really. We're using them differently, the aeration tanks. One will have higher oxygen, Some next one will have lower oxygen than normal oxygen, and each one has different... Uh, but they flow from one to the other. Yes, they do. Yeah. You can say one tank, but they have different functions. Well, yeah, yeah, I understand, but you can't... You've got eight tanks, you can't work on one. You can you have to shut off four work on, to work on one. Absolutely. Yeah. Wow. That's where we have evolved. Yeah. And is that, that's, would that, if you were to build a new plant, would that be built the same way? It's kind of how you do it. It's a settling I, time thing or a stand time thing. And if you built a new plant and needed aeration tanks, I would say it'd be along the same guidelines, but I'd probably say let's do the tanks a little differently. Yeah. We may not need that new clarifier either because that might be a, a peak flow issue, mm -hmm. hydraulic capacity issue. So if the 35, I don't know if that was based on the assumption of 35 million gallons a day peak flow. Well, I, I think, think it was. So, so that's like a million, yeah. So we may not, we may not need that one. Which was, that was 1.8 million to add another clarifier. Plus, plus, plus. Plus, 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 right. Well, was, there, was there ever any um, infrastructure on that particular site where that clarifier was identified? I don't know, it's awful close to flood control. It is. But, you know, going back to the, the 50s plant you mentioned, was there anything constructed over in that, uh, to like a triangular green space? There was a grit collection over there, I believe, at one time. Mr. Dostal probably could, if he shows up, uh, could shed more light on what was there at the time. Okay. Is that where the sludge drying beds were too out there? Sludge drying beds were out towards the where the aeration tanks are and all the clarifiers are. That was a sludge drying area. So you had grit, the or the existing chlorine contact chambers were the primary treatment clarifiers for the Northampton at the time. So grit was out there too. Mm -hmm. So the importance of some of the secondary treatment recommendations seem like they're pretty to me I, I always felt like there were things that should be done. I don't know what your, your sense is, John. Wait like, till she flips the tape, so I'll get you on tape saying, yeah, we should do those yeah. for next week. Or, no, yeah. we don't need to. That's what we want to hear him say. Leave. That's what we're going to hear him say. <laughs> <laughs> the secondary part. If I had to look at the secondary part of the treatment at this point, the, the aeration tank should be looked at if we're going to do any rehabbing there, we should take a look at the aeration tanks inside the tanks and, and see if we can get those valves working just in case we have to optimize the, uh, yeah. the process. Yeah. Right now we're in a set mode right now with the aeration tanks and it works, mm -hmm. but there's nothing saying that something will dictate that we have to do something sure. different. <coughs> uh, take, take the secondary up to the I believe we can go. We can go with the secondary and use the sludge. Can go in the sludge process, Jim. Keep going. Uh, we. I think we do have a need for a uh, uh, another clear, another thickener. Yeah. But we have. I didn't see too much used in this conversation, this book, saying that why not take one of the digesters and make that into a bigger thickener with a, uh, a flight mechanism underneath instead of air, and use that as a thickener. So that would give us the redundancy. I think that they hinted at it as being used for something. But you you, you do have a you do have a, a, a 
vessel right now that can be rehabbed, I think, rather cheaply because you have the vessel and you have a you can pump to it and you can take stuff out of it and pump it to, for dewatering. I don't we don't use them now. Right now they're <coughs> excuse me. Right now they're empty. They were uh, an extension of the gravity belt thickener uh, filter press there, press and uh, didn't work out. And that's what they referred to in this uh, in this uh, study. Yeah. Uh, then we we should take a look at the uh, the dewatering equipment and then and then the, the conveyance. Then after that, the conveyance systems, to how the sludge gets into the boxes. Right now we're I would say we're doing okay, but it, it, it could raise its head and then we would be in a, a higher mode of uh, activity. Uh, as far as planning for the future on uh, what we're going to do with nitrogen, I we'll go back to the, the, the same thing we're talking about where we haven't been, it hasn't been dictated to what we're doing. And our mm -hmm. permit is being issued as we speak. We just haven't got it yet, so we don't know what the guidelines are. And it may also be that phosphorus may come up at some point in time in the next 10, 10 years. But who knows? Our permit will be for five years once we get it, but there's nothing saying that we that they will not tell us to make changes at any given time. So what about fixing what we got? What about the headworks of the primary treatment, um, primary clarifier, some of these things to have identified? Yeah, rehab grit tanks and replace commutators with fine screening. If you can get away with doing that, yes, but there's all kinds of restraints on how you're going to have to make the flow. Uh, you're going to have to make the flow be deeper somehow. The channel we have right now where our bar rack is, you cannot put one of these fine screen things in. You're either going to have to go outside the building and put another separate building now outside in the parking lot and make the channel deeper for a fine screen to work. And is and then keep the ex the existing headworks as a redundant, more redundant. So you're going to have to run both of them no matter what. If the flow goes into the old old headworks, the bar racks are still going to work. Your, your grits <coughs> handling is still going to have to be run because you're going to collect it. You're going to collect something. So, so you'd have if you had a separate fine screen grit station. And you were still connected to the old headworks, and you didn't strip out all that equipment. You'd still now you'd be running two, two things. So, what's your thought on the existing grid tanks? Are they they're adequate? Not, to, they're adequate. They're adequate. Uh, okay. We could use some new chains, probably some new sprockets. More like routine maintenance. Routine. You could order this stuff. Yeah. We and do need to have some kind of a change or an upgrade uh, or a, a rehab for our aeration part of the grid tanks. That stuff is old. In fact, we just had a person come in yesterday and give us a quote because one of the air feed pipes to our, inside the grid tanks there's uh, um, orifices that blow air. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the feed lines has now been compromised, so now we had a person come in yesterday and get it. That's more like parts replacement. Yeah. 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 Okay. So that that could be put off. Put off. Yes, okay. it can. Um, primary clarifiers. They're talking about replacing the clarifiers <coughs> and the pumps. Um, the the pumps for the clarifiers should be replaced. Yeah. I mean the pumps, the primary pumps. That would be the primary clarifiers. The primary sludge pumps should be replaced. They're, they're old and worn out. We've okay. actually had them apart, and there is. Not much life left in them, or the efficient. Let's just say the efficiency has really gone down. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as changing, uh, upgrading anything out there in the clarifiers, mm -hmm. like the whole flight systems, mm -hmm. I imagine if we could take one down and they could decide what they want to rehab on those, it'd be fine to get something new in there. But they're working pretty good. Okay. Uh, their suggestion of putting explosion proof motors out there, we. Not excited about it. I'm not excited about it. You know, they might be explosion proof now or, or they might not be. Yes. They're 12 feet up in the, uh, above a tank, and the whole tank is about the. So they're in a confined space? 
No, not really. Yeah. It, they're, I think they're concerned about fumes coming out sure. of the <coughs> clarifier, yeah. but it has to come up 12 feet. And then maintain its concentration. Yeah. Yeah. And you got seven. If you get the slightest breeze, I mean, you're it's never going to maintain a concentration. So why don't we just buy a fan? So, okay. on that, I can't say uh, anything. There's also a suggestion on that same note there at the primary clarifiers that they wanted to put an odor control station in there between the secondaries and the primaries. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is the where the uh, the sawtooth wears on the primaries, where the water goes over and hits the beach plate, that's where odors get released. Sure. They want to put a, a, a thing around it so it, we can convey odors from there yep. into an immediate station. Yeah. I can't see why we can't come down and put a, uh, a, 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 a tube mm -hmm. down to the old system and put a couple inline fans in it and uh, run it that way. And, do, and, and do we and have odor issues? Every once in a while during a, uh, let's say August, mm -hmm. or a real hot still yeah. night where yeah. maybe the wind is blowing slowly from the south, mm -hmm. or blowing it from the south, you'll get Hugo's and that part of Pleasant Street going, it's a gag out, but those are the guys out there smoking cigarettes at night going, it stinks out here. <laughs> yeah, but you have to have consideration that that does get inundated sometimes with our odor. Okay. And the other one is, is that, uh, Sometimes because of the dike system, mm -hmm. it's it, it gets there. trapped in there. And we do have a resident that keeps us pretty well posted when it's bad. And uh, we get maybe maybe three or four a year. On our, okay. okay. But it's at, in the summertime mostly. Something we should pay attention to. So that right there, they also say the headworks generates uh, an odor, but I haven't really noticed it. During the night, from the because we have the but you've doors. You've only been there 30 years, right? The well, the doors are shut and the fans are gone. We have taken out the odor control that was in the headworks, but yep. we haven't had <coughs> that much of an issue, I believe, with that, it, as opposed to open tanks right, right on top of a neighborhood. Sure. sure. And then you, I guess they also put something on the uh, secondaries too. The, the clarifier pumps that need replacement <coughs> would they be the same pumps? Just order the same pumps. I would think so. They'd be centrifugal. Uh, that would make the most sense. I mean, it, it's a good working system. So um, it's just the uh, the internals are wearing down because of the uh, you know amount of grit that comes through and stuff like that. And uh, I mean, those pumps were probably put in what '79. Yeah. So they've definitely gone well past their uh, anticipated lifespan. Right. So. So they, you, they don't have to be redesigned or anything, just because... If, if the footprint is the same, I can't see why we can, why a pump couldn't be bought and, and put in. If the footprint is different from the new design on the same pump, then there'd be mo some modifications. Mm -hmm. But as far as ripping the whole place apart, I, I don't see it. But new pumps would be in place because that would get us up to uh, the present. And you could now say, okay, 25 years from now, you'd be thinking about maybe doing some replacement on that mm -hmm. because the, this whole thing's driven by replacement in 20 something years. Well, it's a lot of it's driven. Right? Anything we put in today is going to be replaced in 20 years. Yeah. <coughs> um, so, what about this <coughs> one for sludge optimized sludge storage mm -hmm. for contract hauling? Well, we have had suggestions for the trap that I guess they're called. Trailers, they, they come oh, out. Oh, to make dumps. it to, to allow you to use bigger vehicles. And that's been a, a, an ongoing issue for many years. And, and the reason why we can't do it is because either our sludge bays are too short, or and also we have uh, the hanging conveyor system yeah. in the sludge bay, so you can't get the stuff in there. Uh, we added a couple feet to the building the last time and now they're talking about adding a couple more feet to the building so you have all these seams and uh, an apparatus. And because you want you want the whole vehicle enclosed or you just want the trailer they want, inside? They want just the, the trailer so the truck can just back up, hook, he doesn't have to lift it, he doesn't have to do anything but drive, drop or come back and pick it up and drive out. Mm -hmm. 
and then undetach and put a new box in if he's got an empty. If that could work, that would be very nice. Yep. Sounds like that would be incorporated with, <coughs> if we did other sludge dewatering system improvements, that would just be. That, yeah, right that's all, it. that's pretty well uh, integrated with upstairs too and what yep. you're going to do there. Right. So the next one we haven't talked about is um, centralized PLC monitoring and control. Uh, the, the treatment plant right now is very archaic. We, it's a very hands-on plant. Yeah. We have an alarm in a certain part of the plant. It will come into an alarm system up at the control building. We, we will respond. Let's say a high sump pump alarm or uh, you know, chlorine failure. What I believe they're talking here is adding a SCADA, yeah. a SCADA system mm -hmm. that will come to a central SCADA system at the control building through, I imagine, radio waves or, uh, or wire. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, we can be able to monitor it like the water treatment plant from home or check it out. Yeah. It, even, if, even if you get there and to an alarm, you can check out the various parts of the plant to see what's going on. And that would not be just alarms. That would be uh, pumping pumping efficiencies, uh, what pumps are on, what pumps aren't on. And Levels. And then you get, to the, you get to the far end of it. Will the system allow you to turn things off and on by just pushing buttons from a remote area? Yeah, I think we need to make some decisions about that as we look at each upgrade the plan. I think, um, you know, monitoring, I guess, would be the first step, so you can at least remotely see what's happening, <coughs> and then whether you take that and turn it into any type of control system. I mean, obviously, the water plant, which was built recently from scratch, everything, all the valves are automated, and everything can be run, like, you know, everything can be run from the computer. There's also the ability to store data. Yeah, the data is, you know, is amazing to have. Right particularly for troubleshooting or optimizing, you know, the operation. But this plant we have now is every valve is manual. Mm -hmm. So in order to get it into the current way of using SCADA, right. you have to rehab, not rehab, but you have to add something on to every valve and make sure these valves are workable. Motorized operators yeah, and two motors. Yeah. Yeah. And those are really expensive too, so far that when the motors and operators need to be replaced or whatever. So. But the other thing you have to be aware of is making sure that even though you have the ability to remotely access this equipment, that you also build in enough security so that somebody can't hack in and do some damage to your equipment right. too. So you have to be aware of that and that's also an extra layer that you have to... There's a lot of complexity to it. I mean, that's certainly a, a problem that we're more aware of. But the other issues with it is or that if you have a problem with a valve that fails or some other type of problem with the um, with the programming in a failure situation, you can have you can have a problem with the plant because of the SCADA design, then you need to go back and change how the SCADA system is programmed. Like the SCADA at the water plant, we've done a, we've done many, many program modifications since the plant went online to make the, the plant more fail safe. But there have been a couple of problems at the plant that have occurred because of the way the SCADA programming was done initially. <coughs> and it's sort of a, one of these kinks type of things, right? You don't realize that the kink is there until something happens and you're like, oh, yeah, okay, that, that line of code, that's not good, we need to replace that. So there, it brings risks too, um, but I have to say, totally automating the planet, it seems like whether it's feasible or desirable or affordable would be a pretty big question. Um, certainly a monitoring aspect, but, you know, trying to, Trying kind to of automate everything seems like a really high bar. I wouldn't recommend it. Yeah. yeah. Until you get the whole plant where you want, and then you can start taking it piece by piece. But yeah, I mean, you, you have to make yeah, the, you almost there. have to make you almost have to make the decision going in because you, you you know for every valve that you spec, is it is an automated valve or not? And and then if you have a SCADA system, are you running the conduit and the information line so that everything is connected in a smart way? So you almost philosophically, at the beginning when we start doing any improvements, you almost need to philosophically make that decision about the level of SCADA that you want, if you want it at all, is it just for monitoring, is it for some limited control, is it for no control, is it, do you want any of it? You know, that, that would be 
you need to set that as part of the program, I would think, up front, and then every time you do a, an improvement project to the plant, then you'll know automated valves, no, we don't need them. This type of monitoring, yes, we do want that. This type of alarm, okay, we do want that. And need to go through and make a decision with every every aspect of the plant. Well, I'd have to defer to the team that's moving forward with it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you have to look at it. Do you think do you think it's beneficial? Are there any benefits? What are the costs with it? What we have now for a response for anything is <coughs> a person on, a, on, a, on an auto dialer will call out to a guy after hours and he'll come down and he'll personally look at something. Yeah, P plants have worked well for decades. Yeah, like that. Data. You know, that's, and I think that's your point. You know, it can be a simple system and uh, as long as you have a adequate alarm systems and communication systems, you know, it'll work well. Are there benefits that you want to achieve by spending more on SCADA? Be something we need to decide. But the other thing is we have to make sure that even though we automate processes, we need that ability to run it manually too because uh, you can run into problems. Well, we actually ran into a problem with the, uh, the flight pumps because when we were starting to have problems and we were losing the VFDs, we had no way to swap over and run the pump manually. It just was totally dead. As opposed to the uh, aeration blowers, if you get a, a VFD goes down on an aeration blower, you can flip the switch over to bypass, uh, it'll run 100%, but I mean, you still have the ability to aerate your, uh, your uh, organisms there. So that ability to be able to manually take over and uh, fine tune the process yourself is something that you always have to keep in the back of your mind. That, you have that ability in case uh, your technology fails on you. I believe that was mentioned in this report. Uh, mm -hmm. in, in just a few couple lines, though. Right, and the capital FY15 budget, we had 150000 for the VFT bypass. Right, so to address that to address that exact issue. So. Well, at least they're listening to you. Oh. <laughs> yeah, we had a lot of water that day. <laughs> Next item we touched on a few minutes ago is odor control at the headworks and the primaries. So it sounds like it's a something we should keep in mind, but it's not a odor's not a huge priority at the moment. Not really. Yeah. I mean, we get complaints, so we can't ignore it. But um, we've, we've had a really good neighborhood. Yeah. yeah. And then the. Next one is uh, scum concentrator. Replace it with new equipment. It's in it's in need to be uh, addressed. This one is like 1970 vintage. Yes. Original equipment. Right. And it's all metal and yes. in tough shape, <coughs> but still functioning at the moment. Uh, yes. If we if we had to let it run some more, we could get it. I think we get a couple more years out of it. We might we might have to change the change the chains and maybe the flights in it yep. and the sprockets to drive them. Yep. So maybe some routine maintenance more than replacing them. Right. If we had to. I mean, I'm not too sure how thin the steel walls are right now holding this stuff. It could <laughs> break on me as we're speaking here, but uh, I, I think it's. Well, know, maybe the scum will seal it up. We've got some time. <laughs> yeah. There's that possibility. He says the tendency to right. put quite the seal around things. Right. There's one, there's one thing we didn't touch on here so far in the conversation while we're in the thickener building where uh, the scum concentrator is, is that we don't have any redundancy with the pumping sludge, uh, thickened sludge to the sludge process. We have one piston pump in there. In this uh, document it did say it's a, vintage, it's a vintage piston pump, and it is. But it seems to be the one that works the best <coughs> in the plant. But there is no redundancy, so if it goes down, we are sort of in a quandary in pumping second uh, thickened sludge to our sludge process building. I believe we could probably pump waste activated and primary pump to one of the big digester holding tanks and go from there, but we do need a piston pump or, or some kind of a pump conveyance. A pump to convey some. This is original plant design. 
Monster? Uh, <laughs> no, the original plant design was we had uh, diaphragm pumps, yeah. which ran off compressor, pressed, compressed yeah. air. Yeah. And as those things became more worn out and more uh, maintenance, uh, used yeah. a lot of maintenance, and, and yeah. it was also a dangerous environment to work in. Yeah. Uh, we took a piston pump from the old digesters yeah. and Put it in the thickness. So it was stopgap when it was done. Right, and it's been working very well. Yeah. But in the event that it doesn't work well, you don't. We don't. That have can't it. be a big ticket item. No, I wouldn't think so. But yeah. that's that's something that should happen. But it's got piping and all that. You got to do. Can you get parts for it? For the piston pumps, yes, yeah. we can. Is there enough room to put in the second one? It'll be very uh, uh, close. Yeah. Actually, if you uh, took out the old diaphragm pumps, probably uh, most of the pedestals that those sit on would be enough room to uh, put something else in. But it'd have to be looked at. That's in the basement of, the, of that building, right? Yes, it is. Yeah. Right between those two thickeners, you right. walk downstairs. Yeah. And those are the, those, you're, when you're down in that basement, you're looking at the tank walls. Yes, you are. Yeah. If, if you can get parts, how much time it would be involved when the pump would be down and the, the, how many hours, how many days? I'd like to, I'd like to say turn around through our, for, for, if we had the parts on site, on site we yeah. could probably get away uh, fixing something within three days, which we could have three days of capacity or we could actually put up with three days of sludge going around in the plant. Well, maybe as a minimum, we should have spare parts on site. I, b I believe we do have a few, but we don't have like the uh, the pistons themselves or the shafts. But in order to take one down for maintenance, this all has to be done after hours and has to be all put back together after hours because every day we use them, Monday through Friday. So there is no redundancy and even a, a decent maintenance schedule for this. So it, I, it, the emergency part, yes, I could see having parts and stuff, but if you don't have that one part, so if you're going to have a whole slew of parts to fix one that's broken, you might as well have another piston pump sitting there, so you just switch the switch well, and then well, take parts that you have. Get it right. Take the other one offline and get it fixed, and that way you get that right. back up. Right, because it's, it's not a big dollar item, is it? I don't think so. Uh, it, it just depends. The, the part where it will become a big dollar item is how you put it in the building and, can, and, and start moving the pipes around to make it work. But it's, it's, it's still, that's <coughs> not a big dollar item. But that's another issue that should be addressed for just getting sludge over to the, to the, to the sludge process building. And what kind of sludge does that pump? It's, sludge, it's, it's a combined sludge of primary sludge and waste activated sludge. And that waste activated comes from the bottom of the secondary clarifiers. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, comes in probably at 1.5% after it's mixed. And uh, then after, it's, after it gets mixed, it comes over at about 3. Yeah. On the average, sometimes it could be <coughs> more or sometimes it's less, but it's... That's what we basically uh, dewater every day, that percentage. And then we turn that into, uh, after the dewatering, it's about 20%, 19 to 21%, sometimes 22. Which drives the fact in the rest of the book that we need to get something in there that can uh, dewater uh, a drier cake and probably more, and, and take more liquid. I'm pretty good with the plant stuff for today. Yeah. I mean, we could talk about it for two more days, I'm sure, but... It seems pretty helpful, right, just to have gone through the, those projects. Yeah, well, well, to get our head into it so that when we sit down next week with Kleinfelder, we're a little bit more up to speed. Like most good reports, it doesn't tell you exactly what you need to do. Hmm. Well, because... 
they can't say we don't need to do any of this. That's correct. You know, that's the uh, that's the challenge. So the other thing we didn't touch on today was um, all the pump stations that we have. Okay. And any recommendations that might come out of that. The only one that's recommended for full replacement. Well, actually, there's we're several. Seven, there's we're I'm looking at page seven. <coughs> At page 23 in the beginning. They've isolated Atwood pump station and then they have all the remaining pump stations. And if I remember, I did about a $5 million price tag on those pump stations, on all of them. Which is the one we just did? Bradford Street. Bradford Street. Bradford Street. Yeah. Bradford? Bradford. Was there. So under page 14 of 23, it comes into the general recommendations of what's going on. It's $5.3 million plus the 1.07 for Atwood. So it's you know, $6 million plus in pump station work. Well, Bradford Street's interesting. It's included because you have to do something with the planning period of the report. But we just built it. <laughs> I, I could put a low priority next to that. You could. Very low. <laughs> um, they're talking about replacing three Bird's Pit Road, Island Road, and Rick Drive. I forget now why these, their reasoning for replacing was it doesn't obviously it doesn't make sense to rehabilitate I think, them. I think these are the ones that are the canisters. These the are tubes. The yes. Yeah. What yeah. kind of pumps? Centrifugal. Centrifugal. Oh. And and leachate and William Street are like flight pumps. Yes, they submersible are. Submersible pumps. Yes. Okay. <laughs> and our preference is now to have all submersibles in these types of stations is for the small stations. Is that correct or not? The leachate plant, yes. And the Williams, yes. Those are submersibles. Mm -hmm. The other stations, they have the pumps are in dry wells, the suction at, the suctions are in the wet well. So you have a wet well and a dry well with uh, Burt's Pit, Island Road, and Rick Drive. Yep. I did not know what was the driving force for Bird Street Road, Island Road, and Rick Drive. Well, they're talking about confined space entry. Uh, confined space entry is a place that's not supposed to be used for any kind of long-term working. Mm -hmm. But we do have uh, we do have fan air exchange down in those down in those units. So I'm not too sure if it really falls in those canisters fall into the actual definition of confined space. I think that's a, a gray area. Because they're ventilated? They're ventilated. There's... I mean, because they're ventilated, they, they don't... No, there's, there's air exchange down there, so yeah. I could go down there for four or five hours without any, uh, without any air apparatus right. being supplied. The only part of the can, uh, canister that is falling into a confined space is there's the you have to tie off to go down in them otherwise right. there's a falling issue right um, I, and, and and there's one way in and one way out right but it's not an environment in the in the in the in the unit itself where it's detrimental to work in so it's a low hazard confined space I would say so right. so seems what, that Kleinfeld are those Putting a lot of emphasis on not accessing a below grade chamber uh, for worker safety. They issued actually a couple different things on, on page 65 and 66 on these, and part of it is um, the steel can and actually hazard working in those can stations, but also the fact that all these pump stations were installed in the late 60s and mid 70s or so, and they really have run their useful life at this point, I think. 
and therefore we should be looking at upgrades of some sort. And what that upgrade should be is probably not what we have out there. Is the Edwood now adequately sized for the new buildings? I don't know offhand, but I believe it well, would be. Otherwise, it'd be being replaced as these buildings are going up. Right. So, it's, so it's working. <coughs> I assume that the engineer submitted reports that the pump station has the capacity to serve <coughs> buildings out there. But they did treat Atwood Drive as its own scenario, which they discussed in this chapter or somewhere else in here. That and why did why did they pick out Atwood? being different than the others? Probably because it does not have emergency backup power. Okay. And all the others do. Looks well Except for William Street, of course. Well, they're also saying that they, they determined that it's possible to eliminate the existing Edward pump station and replace it with gravity sewer. Right. But, it, it, but if it's working, would you really want to consider that? Well, it says, however, the cost of such a project was estimated to be significantly greater than right. the construction, rehabilitation, and operation of a new pump station over the 50-year design life. Yeah, it would be a formidable project to, to change that over to a, to a gravity sewer and yeah. uh, probably highly disruptive to the area at the same time. Yeah. You probably had your chance before those two new buildings went in. Right. I believe one of the buildings does go, doesn't it? Not, I don't think both of them go to the, the pump station. The new <coughs> hotel and the new restaurant, I believe the new restaurant going in at some point will be gravity fed to the Mount Tom, Maine. But I believe the hotel and the three new buildings right. will go to the pump station. That, that gravity is right at the end of the road. Around. Right. Well, you would think that it would be gravity from the pump station, but maybe not. <coughs> so that the main is always full. Well, it's a force main. Right. So <coughs> at a certain point, it has to be gravity. But There's a section in Atwood Drive that is gravity that it goes to. Yeah. Okay, how far is it? Two or three hundred feet up the road? Yeah. So they make it sound like the Atwood Drive pump station is falling apart. It well, it does need work. Uh, that's it. We've 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 done some work where the uh, the, air, the air tube going from the dry well to the wet well, uh, we've, we've cobbed it in some fashion that's been working for the last few years, but it could use some rehab. Uh, the hours that I do every week, uh, they don't show that the the station is being overtaxed right now. But it does not have a source of generation. Right. So when you lose power, there's going to be an issue down there with us trying to keep that wet well empty during an emergency situation. Is there any particular reason not to have backup power on site? Well, it used to be just the restaurant, I guess, at the Clarion. Right. And that was it. So In the gas station that was there. So I don't think that was a very big high priority. I don't know why they'd have a pump station in that area without backup generator, even, even if it was just the first day it was built. Unless it was just an after, afterthought and went, oh, we're good, it's good enough. I don't, I don't understand it. Didn't the city add... Is this the city that added standby power after the fact to the pump stations? And the generators got mounted up high in some places? There, there, at Island Road, at Island Road, Island Road, we had to have the generator put up high yeah. because of uh, the flood, flood waters. Right. And it's run off propane, so if the water does come up, the propane tank floats if it has to float. <laughs> and the generator will not get affected by any high water. I vaguely remember asking the developer for an emergency generator for that Atwood pump station when they built those buildings. Yeah. I need to check with David Bellani about that. I know it was something we discussed in town. Yeah. Because they were adding a lot of new flow to the pump station. We had no backup power. Right. So I vaguely remember that we may have asked for that. They may have agreed. <coughs> I don't want to be on the record of saying that that's going to happen until I double check the file on it. Could be. 
a good inquiry. Yeah. If we get back to replacing the pump stations at Burst Pit, Island Road, and Rick Drive, if they're going to be replaced like the one at Bradford Street? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it, would be nice. it would be nice for the one at Island Road because that one is probably our deepest one now. You have to go down close to 24 feet. 24, 24 feet to get down to it. No kidding. And the configuration of these tubes are, if you come down the tube, you come to the ceilings, your pumps are over here. So um, your motors and your pumps are over here. So any time you have to pull any of that stuff out, you have to jack up your motor or your pump, move it over to the tube, tube and then pull it up. And stand underneath it while it goes up. Or up to the side and hope it yeah. doesn't bounce. Uh, but that's your considerations for working in those pump stations. They have pump stations now where uh, they bring every all the controls and everything up to the top and I, and I believe you don't have to go down. Well, and if you had submersible pumps, you could put them on rails. Right. Yeah, you could. And have the controls in a separate vault or something. And, and be able to pull them out. Yeah, without, without any, going down. Without going down, yeah. But they seem to work pretty well. You have trouble the, finding anybody to go down that tube? They go down once a week. Oh, my God. We used to go down every day. Thanks. Until you have legs like a goat. Uh, <coughs> But uh, I'd like to see what they would want to, s how they would like to replace it. If they replace it with submersible pumps, that that would work. Okay, also help out. Motion to adjourn. Oh, I can't say that. Oh, we don't have to because this is not an official meeting. We can just get up and leave. <laughs> Thank you. Have you covered it? I think so. Great. Thank you guys very much.